Another video about panoramic photography is here. So today you can look forward to the third part of the most detailed tutorial on how to shoot panoramas. All right then, let's get to it. So we have the composition and we know which lens we'll use. Uh, wait a moment, actually we don't know. How could we know? So which lens should we choose? Okay, so we have placed a tripod. Now we have to make a final decision which composition we'll be shooting and which focal length we'll be using. Okay, Martin, can you show us the composition you have chosen and your final choice of focal length for this composition and why, please? This is the composition we have chosen. There are some beautiful mountains in the background, uh, the water and some stones in the midground, and this beautiful tiny pond in the foreground, which is beautiful and we can see under the water for all the structures inside. We have already mentioned that we should try to get the most out of one spot, but we should take enough shots so that the viewer doesn't realize they are all from one photo spot. What does it mean? Just try out all the lenses we currently have available. Personally, I do it like this. I first decide how many photos I can actually bring home. Let's consider the ideal example already mentioned where we have the opportunity to take a composition from one identical spot before sunrise, during sunrise, and then sometime after sunrise when the sun is higher in the sky. So first, the pre-sunrise composition. For that, there will be typical cold or blue tones, with the horizon beginning to glow, and in this part of the sky, it starts to color into reds, oranges, and yellows. Since the sun hasn't risen yet, there is relatively little light in the landscape. Therefore, we need to choose longer exposure times. However, this brings one complication. The dawn is breaking and the light is rapidly increasing. So if we decide to shoot, let's say, 50 minutes before sunrise, a wide panorama in multiple rows, we encounter a significant problem. The first photograph will be exposed correctly according to the current lighting conditions. But before we finish perhaps the second or third row, the light dramatically increases due to the aforementioned long exposure times. Now, therefore, the last photo will be very bright and overall each photo will not match tonally and in some cases even in color with the one next to it. Alright, but what about that? There are basically two options. The first option is quite complex and I recommend it only to truly experienced photographers. So as we shoot gradually and the light increases, we must shorten the exposure time for each photo or for every second or third photo. Uh, this way we'll get roughly the same amount of light onto the sensor. However, this method is quite demanding, requiring high experience and even then it's not flawless, especially because you are estimating the shortened time Additionally, each photo will still be somewhat tonally different. So before we start stitching the photos into a panorama, we need to harmonize them tonally and color-wise. Uh, fortunately, for example, Photoshop has a fairly good tool for this, but still it can't perform miracles. However, we have mentioned that this method is really complex and honestly, I personally don't prefer it much either. Only in the case where the pre-sunrise composition truly demands wide panorama in multiple rows. Then, uh, however, I try to help myself a bit. How? By adjusting the ISO. In one of the future videos, we'll focus on exposure parameters for compositions with uh, low light levels and also for night compositions. Precisely determining the correct exposure parameters is crucial there. But even now, I can say that logically, we must increase the ISO slightly for pre-sunrise compositions, at least by 2 EV or 3 EV compared to the base value. Uh, however, I'm talking about relatively small photo projects. Uh, if we need to capture a 200 degree panorama in 3-4 rows, then we must significantly increase the ISO. 
to a value of 1600 or 2000. There is no other option. At these ISO values, the question arises whether to start working with averaging methods, especially for cameras with small sensors. But we'll talk about the averaging method much later within the context of night photography. Besides using higher ISO values, there's another option to speed up the shooting of pre-sunrise compositions. Uh, simply put, we choose a really wide focal lens to minimize the number of source photos. Uh, often we create pre-sunrise panoramas using, for example, an 18mm focal lens, a panorama in a single row from four or five or six photos. Thanks to the ultra-wide focal lens, uh, consequently fewer rows and source photos, and due to the higher ISO, we can capture a pre-sunrise panorama without significant changes in tonality. Of course, not every pre-sunrise panorama is the same. We are still talking about shooting approximately 50 minutes before sunrise, not two minutes before sunrise, when there is almost as much light in the landscape as during the sunrise itself. So, where do you put it all together? For me personally, a pre-sunrise panorama is synonymous with working with ultra-wide focal lens combined with properly set exposure parameters. Then we have sunrise panorama. Uh, we can call it, for example, the main panorama. In this case, we are not limited by time. There is enough light and we can choose any focal lens. But is that really true? Not entirely. The freedom of our choice is influenced by the geographic location that is the place where we are shooting. In other words, significantly far north, like the Norwegian Lofoten Islands, the sun is very slow. Even in the winter months, it still has beautiful colors for an hour or two hours after sunrise, almost as if the sun were just rising. In fact, we had several expeditions to the Lofoten Islands in mid-November. The sun was so low that we could take photos all day and the pictures still appeared like they were taken in the golden hour. The way down south, like in Madeira for example, the path of the sun is much straighter. So let's say 20 minutes after sunrise, it already looks like we are taking pictures in the late morning and not early morning. What does that mean? Taking photos in the north is better for beginners who are just trying to master panoramic photography. So even a relative beginner can use, for instance, a 50 or 85 mm lens and take detailed panoramas in several rows. On the other hand, in the mentioned Madeira, a photographer doesn't have much time. The sun simply jumps above the horizon and soon disappears. So for starters, we recommend using a wider focal lens, even ultra-wide lenses, and rather simple photo projects. But that doesn't mean that more complex photo projects with wide or medium lenses can't be done in Madeira. Not at all. We just need to be a bit quicker. Considering the geographical limitations, however, we can still take the main panorama with whatever lens we find suitable. I mostly use the Zeiss Otus 28mm 1.4 lens. Currently, it's the Zeiss Loxia 25mm f2.4, but not exclusively. There are many places where the main panorama can be created using wide lenses, as well as medium or long lenses. Uh, typically, for instance, Tuscany or the Dolomites. Post sunrise panorama. Panoramas taken after the main panorama, sort of like a post sunrise panorama, are usually the icing on the cake. It's not always the perfect light for taking them. Or it can be difficult to find the right composition. Most often in this case, we use a long lens and try to show the viewer just a narrow landscape shot, which otherwise gets lost in the wide-angle main panorama. If I had to personally count how many times I shoot post-sunrise panoramas, it's probably about 10 to 20% of the time. By the way, have you heard that you can join us on our exclusive photography expeditions to Lofoten in Iceland? If you want to know more, Check the link below.